Hi everyone, Jolene here from Bookworm Adventure Girl. I hope that you are all well. It's another Monday, actually it's Tuesday, uh, which means another episode of Mondays with Margaret. I know that I'm a bit late in getting this video out, so I apologize, but here it is. Today we will be talking about another non-fiction book, Second Words, Selected Critical Prose, 1960 to 1982. Okay, Jax, thanks you. Are you helping? Second Words was originally published in 1982, and this edition from Anansi Press has a great cover. If you've been following this series, then you probably won't be surprised at who the artist is. It's called Par Portrait of Margaret Atwood by her longtime friend Charles Patchter, and this was done in 1980. Second Words actually flows quite nicely from last week's poetry collection, True Stories, um, I said in that video that one of the themes in the collection is the importance of writing and the idea of writing with purpose. Um, it really comes out in a significant way in that collection. In the introduction on page two, Lenny Goodings points out that Second Words brings together uh, pieces written on the side while Atwood was also publishing five novels, a short story collection, several volumes of poetry, a couple of children's books, uh, two books of nonfiction, one television script, and one libretto, and she also gave birth to her daughter, so she was a very busy woman. In the first paragraph of Atwood's introduction, we get a sense of her writing, her observations, and dry wit. She explains why this book is called Second Words, and that's on page 11. This book is called Second Words for two reasons. The first is that I am not primarily a critic, but a poet and novelist, and therefore my critical activities, such as they are, necessarily come second for me. Although for a writer who is essentially a critic, they would, of course, come first. The other reason is based on precedence. That is, a writer has to write something before a critic can criticize it. This is in no way to imply that words spoken first are always better than the critical fabrics raised upon them. It is only to state what seems to be the obvious. That is, you can't have a thought about a stone without first seeing a stone. Atwood also confesses that she doesn't like writing the kinds of things that are brought together in second words. Uh, but she believes she does it out of a sense of duty. She says a book reviews um, sorry, she says book reviews are one of the dues you pay for being a writer, especially in Canada. And what she doesn't say is that she's really good at it, uh, so you would never know that she, that she doesn't like it. The book is divided into three parts, so we will take a look at all three. Um, Atwood's explanations of the three will also answer some questions that I've asked as we've been uh, reading along and following her works. Atwood says the three parts correspond to three periods of her life. Part one is from 1960 to 1971. Atwood calls this rooming house. And during this time, Atwood had moved 15 times, always to places with a lot of stairs to climb and inadequate heat. And it was during this time that she was developing the ideas for survival. You may recall that Atwood has several poems and a few short stories about landladies and rooming houses, and I had wondered at one point um, what her experience was with this, and of course now we know. The second part is from 1972 to 1976. Atwood calls this part dugout and says that this is when she was being attacked a lot. Um, her writing was a response to some of these attacks, especially when it comes to survival. And this part also corresponds to the peak of cultural nationalism and the popularization of feminism. And then the final part is from 1977 to 1982, or the publication of Second Words. Awood had not named this period yet, but she points out that it was during this time she published Lady Oracle and had a baby. Um, thus becoming instantly warm and maternal and temporarily less attacked. She says this period covers her growing involvement with human rights issues, um, and which for her are not separate from writing. From the first review of Winter Sun by Canadian poet Margaret Avison, 
we can immediately recognize Atwood's own talent and understanding of great writing. And I loved this on page 22. Again, if one praises a poet's descriptive powers, one risks conveying the image of a housewife cooking up a poem of the oh beautiful sunset or hooray for autumn variety by applying adjectives to an object like icing to a cake with the same result. If one swallows much of it, one feels a little ill. But Miss Avison never slathers her poems. Her use of descriptive words is not only precise and striking, but so precise and striking that the words do not just describe the object, but are the object. There are other tennis players in both art and life, but her tennis players are the only ones of their kind. Atwood also recognizes what she has already said is important for writers, to describe the world around her. On page 22 to 23, she says, Miss Avison portrays consciousness as an attempt to encounter and to form a relationship with the external. The ultimate locus of such an encounter is the individual human mind, which makes its ordered cosmos out of a chaos which includes bits of society, scraps of sense perception, snips of science, moments of history, chips of myth, and the elbowings of the insistent self, as well as the phenomena of the natural universe. One of the ways I find her reviews interesting is her tendency to tell you how the poem or book or magazine could have gone downhill. And she'll give an example, then she will say, you know, but that didn't happen here. And it's an, an interesting and sometimes humorous way of uh, giving a compliment. For example, when reviewing George Johnston's The Cruising Auk, she says on page 29, a simple comic verse rhythm and a punchline sequence tend to become tedious after the first five minutes, as anyone who has read too much Robert W. Service or Rudyard Kipling at a time will know. But Johnston, because he uses his rather exacting forms with a great deal of variety, never bores. In Atwood's longest review in this section, The Early Forms of She by Ryder Haygard, we see one of the things that I love about Atwood. She can explain something like no one else can. Here's the example that I loved in this review. It starts on page 35. Though he wrote most of his early novels in an attitude of the most extreme high seriousness, the reader tends to treat them as though they were comic books and read them, if at all, on the sly. He had great success, both popular and critical, during the last decades of the 19th century and was ranked with Kipling and Stevenson. Yet today, his particular combination of high-flown rhetoric and bathos brings to wince to the sensitive nostril of the stylistic analyst, while those willing to go further than the flawed surface of his prose in search of significant archetypes may well founder in a morass of half-grasped symbols, promising but dead-end literary references, and only semi-mythic plots. And I loved the, brings a wince to the sensitive nostril of the stylistic analyst. We also see in this review Atwood's knowledge of literature, as she makes comments about previous works of Haggard. Atwood recognizes patterns and how the work she is reviewing has come from the previous work. In Four Poets from Canada, Atwood makes a comparison between D.G. Jones, George Jonas, Eli Mandel, and A.W. Purdy. She not only compares how different they are um, as Canadian poets, but what sets them apart from English or American poets. Atwood says it has something to do with space. So we see some of the ideas of survival taking shape here. D.G. Jones has space between things. George Jonas, the space is between people. For Eli Mandel, Atwood says on page 58 that his third collection is a trip to inner space, a consciousness cut adrift in its own voice. And Atwood describes Purdy as one of Canada's most versatile and prolific poets. And then she says this about his work. Uh, this is on page 60. She says, Purdy can be banal, silly, cute, overly rhetorical, irrelevant, and corny. And then she describes what makes him one of Canada's finest poets in a way, again, that only Atwood can. She says on page 60, One thing is his trick of including his opposites. There are many overlapping self-created versions of Purdy, 
but three strains can be isolated. A.W., intellectual, amateur, archaeologist, amateur historian, not above references to philosophy, mythology, and what have you. Alfred Wellington, a sentimentalist with a big soggy heart who indulges in globs of love and fantasizes of being a mother robin and plain Al who sneers at A.W.'s pretensions, questions Alfred's Wellington's motives and puts down the reader when either of the others has sucked him in. Which is the real one? They all are, and when two or more are gathered together, the result is a dazzling display of psychological fancy footwork. One of Purdy's specialties is catching himself in the act, and at these moments his honesty and his wire-cutter toughness are never in doubt. When talking about the Canadian magazine Alphabet, Atwood is able to make distinctions again about what makes it Canadian. And if you've been following the series along and have read Survival or saw the video, you will not be surprised that At what Atwood does here. Um, she does the same thing she did in Survival. She shows the differences between what the English, Americans, and Canadians think about literature. So I'm going to read a part from page 93 to 94 that shows this. The English habit of mind with its preoccupation with precedent and the system might be called empirical. Reality for it is the social hierarchy and its dominant literary forms are evaluative criticism and the social novel. It values taste. The American habit of mind with its background of intricate Puritan theologizing, French enlightenment, political theory and German scholarship and its foreground of technology is abstract and analytical. It values technique and for it reality is how things work. The Canadian habit of mind for whatever reason, perhaps a history and a social geography which both seem to lack coherent shape is synthetic. Taste and technique are both of less concern to it than is the ever failing but ever renewed attempt to pull all the pieces together, to discover the whole of which one can only trust one is a part. The most central Canadian literary products then tend to be large scope works like the Anatomy of Criticism and the Gutenberg Galaxy, which propose all embracing systems within which any particular piece of data may be placed. Give the same poem to a model American, a model English, and a model Canadian critic. The American will say, this is how it works. The Englishman, how good, how true to life, or how boring, tasteless, and trite. The Canadian will say, this is where it fits into the entire universe. It is in its love for synthesis that Alphabet shows itself peculiarly Canadian. Moving into part two of Second Words, Atwood says this on page 105. The publication of Survival caused a certain flurry. Although surfacing put me on the literary map in places like New York and London, it was Survival that put me on the rubber chicken map in places like the Empire Club Toronto. Canadians have traditionally been rather queasy about words such as literature and art. They would much rather talk about them than actually come to grips with them. Though in defense of Canadians, let me say at once that their per capita readership is very high, higher than that of the States and England. Survival was fun to attack. In fact, it still is. Most self-respecting professors of can lit begin their courses, I'm told, with a short ritual sneer at it. It's true that it has no footnotes. The intended audience was not the footnote crowd, and it reached its intended audience which was all those people whose high school English teachers told them they weren't studying Canadian literature because there wasn't any. Survival was published in 1972, so some of the writings in this section are responses to survival. And Atwood begins this section with Travels Back that gives a little bit of background on her life. And on page 108, she explains, Highway 17 was my first highway. I traveled along it six months after I was born, from Ottawa to North Bay and then to Temis Gaming, and from there over a one-track dirt road into the bush. After that, twice a year north when the ice went out, south when the snow came. The time between spent in tents or in the cabin built by my father on a granite point a mile by water from a Quebec village so remote that the road went in only two years before I was born. The towns I've passed and will pass Arn Pryor, Renfrew, Pembroke, Chalk River, Mattawa, the old gingerbread mansions in each of them built on lumber money 
and the assumption that the forest would never give out. They were landmarks, way stations. That was 30 years ago though, and they've improved the highway now. To me, nothing but the darkness of the trees is familiar. I didn't spend a full year in school until I was 11. Americans usually find this account of my childhood woodsy, isolated, nomadic. Less surprising than do Canadians, after all. It's what the glossy magazine ads say Canada is supposed to be like. They're disappointed when they hear I've never lived in an igloo, and my father doesn't say, on huskies, like Sergeant Preston on the defunct American radio program. But other than that, they find me plausible enough. It's Canadians who raise eyebrows, or rather the Torontonians. It's as though I'm a part of their own past they find disreputable, or fake, or just can't believe ever happened. This essay is about Atwood's poetry readings, the people she meets along the way, and the need for Canadian identity. Near the end, she says this, which I think is important, and it's on page 113. She says, I don't think Canada is better than any other place, any more than I think Canadian literature is better. I live in one and read the other, for a simple reason. They are mine, with all the sense of territory that implies. Refusing to acknowledge where you come from, and that must include the noodle man and his hostilities, the anti-nationalist lady and her doubts, is an act of amputation. You may become free-floating, a citizen of the world, and in what other country is that an ambition? But only at the cost of arms, legs, or heart. By discovering your place, you discover yourself. Matthews and Misrepresentation is Atwood's response to Robin Matthews' review of survival. It is in this response that Atwood says the minimum qualification for a critic should be the ability to read and write. Before responding to Matthews, Atwood looks at other responses to survival. Atwood says that there were seven serious criticism. To each one of these criticisms, Atwood responds in her typical Atwood way, making clarifications, giving examples, and with her dry wit. Then she turns to Matthew's review, where she has marked all of the paragraphs she sees a misrepresentation. His critiques range from thinking the book is a teacher's manual to pinpointing things he thinks Atwood got wrong. And as I was reading this, all I kept thinking was I wouldn't want to go up against Atwood unless um, I had really done my homework. Um, Atwood's response on page 137 says, just as Matthews has to distort survival to get out of it the straw book he wants, so must he distort works of Canadian literature themselves to get support for his position. He does this a lot. This shows that Atwood at this point isn't just defending survival, but other works of Canadian literature as well. And she also says, uh, which made me laugh, that Matthews has a tendency to rewrite books in his head, so they say what he wishes they had said. Moving away from survival for a minute, Atwood reviewed Rini's collected poetry. What I wanted to point out about this is that she is doing what I see you know, so many people do on Bookstagram and even here on YouTube or Booktube. After she describes the poetry and the structure, she talks about how good the book looks. On page 159, she says this. The physical appearance and presentation of a book such as this is really the least important part of it, but it never hurts a book to look good. Typeface and design, spare and antique, but somehow lush and eccentric are in harmony with Rini's world. This might be the least important thing, but as book lovers, we know this is sometimes what draws us to a book. And she also talks about the accessibility of the collection. And this is something that was really important to Atwood when she wrote Survival, uh, that it wouldn't be just for the academics, but that anyone could afford to get a copy. And she says this on page 159, the most unattractive thing about this collection is its price. The ways of publishers are unfathomable, but I hope someone can convince New Press to bring Rini's poems out in paperback soon so that more than a few people will have the chance to read what Rini actually wrote rather than what he is popularly supposed to have written. The difference, it seems to me, is considerable.
Outwood's review of Adrian Rich's seventh book of poems makes me want to read it. She says on page 160, when I first heard the author read from it, I felt as though the top of my head was being attacked, sometimes with an ice pick, sometimes with a blunter instrument, a hatchet or a hammer. The predominant emotions seem to be anger and hatred, and these are certainly present. But, I read the po but when I read the poems later, they evoked a far more subtle reaction. Diving into the Wreck is one of those rare books that forces you to decide not just what you think about it, but what you think about yourself. It is a book that takes risks, and it forces the reader to take them also. There's also the importance here for Atwood that this is literature that makes us reflect on ourselves. In What's So Funny? Notes on Canadian Humour, Atwood points out that humour is not universal, and she tries to answer the question, uh, what do Canadians laugh at? And if you have ever been to a different country, or maybe you've had to learn a different language, uh, then you already know that humor is different and often hard to translate. It's one of the reasons um, I really admire translators of literature because it's such a difficult task. So Atwood points out that there are different types of laughter. And just as she does in survival, Atwood compares typical American, English, and Canadian humor. If laugher and audience and English humor are saying, I am not like them, I am a gentleman. And if their American counterparts are saying, I am not like them, I am not a dupe, Canadian laughers and audiences, or those examined here at any rate, seem to be saying, I am not like them, I am not provincial, I am cosmopolitan. But as provinciality is seen as something irrevocably connected with being Canadian, the audience can renounce its provinciality only by disavowing its Canadianism as well. Who then are these cosmopolitan Canadians, uneasily laughing at their country, their countrymen, and to a lesser extent at themselves? Certainly a large number of them are members of the educated middle class, conditioned through many years of schooling to depreciate things Canadian. Is Canada really such a joke, or is the absurdity in the eyes of the beholder? In the piece called On Being a Woman Writer, I just want to mention a few things that Atwood points out. Um, first, that some writers were so consumed with guilt over what they had been taught to feel was their abnormality that they did their writing at night secretly, uh, so no one would accuse them as failing as a housewife or as a mother or as women. Atwood also talks about a couple of ironies. One is on page 193. She says, one is that in the development of modern Western civilization, writing was the first of the arts, before painting, music, composing, and sculpting, which it was possible for women to practice. And it was the fourth of the job categories, after prostitution, domestic service, and the stage, and before wide-scale factory work, nursing, secretarial work, telephone operating, and school teaching, at which it was possible for them to make any money. The reason for both is the same. Writing as a physical activity is private. You do it by yourself on your own time. No teachers or employers are involved. You don't have to apprentice in a studio or work with musicians. Your only business arrangements are with your publisher, and these can be conducted through the mails. Your real employers can be deceived, if you choose, by the adoption of an assumed male name, witness the Brontes and George Eliot. But the private and individual nature of writing may also account for the low incidence of direct involvement by women writers in the movement now. If you are a writer, prejudice against women will affect you as a writer, not directly, but indirectly. Outwood also shares some of her own personal experiences here. Um, for example, on page 203, as part of Outwood's personal statement, she says the following. I've been trying to give you a picture of the arena or that part of it where being a woman and writer as concepts overlap. But of course the arena I've been talking about has to do largely with externals, reviewing the media relationships with other writers. This for the writer may affect the tangibles of her career, how she is received, how viewed, how much money she makes. But in relationship to the writing itself, this is a false arena. The real one is in her head, her real struggle, the daily battle with words, the language itself. The false arena becomes valid for writing itself only insofar as it becomes part of her material and is transformed into one of the verbal and imaginative structures she is constantly engaging in making. 
Writers as writers are not propagandists or examples of social trends or preachers or politicians. They are makers of books and unless they can make books well, they will be bad writers, no matter what the social validity of their views. I believe that it is this mentality that has made Atwood so successful. And if you are interested in other women who took risks, um, Atwood talks about Kate Millett in this way on page 210. Um, and I think Atwood admires Millet for doing exactly what she talked about in her uh, personal statement. There is also Marge Piercy and Audrey Thomas. In The Curse of Eve, or What I Learned in School, Atwood again talks about her personal journey. She states the fact that not long before she wouldn't have been invited to speak to them and that there would never be a lecture called Women on Women. She says in those days, a woman writer was a freak, an oddity, a suspicious character, and how much of that lingers on today. So this is in the early 80s, um, or sorry, this was in 1978. So I wonder what she would say now and if that has changed. On page 226, I want to read to you what Atwood has to say, uh, which is honest, unfortunate, and again shows her wit. It is more difficult for a woman writer in this society than for a male writer, but not because of any innate mysterious hormonal or spiritual differences. It is more difficult because it has been made more difficult, and the stereotypes still lurk in the wings, ready to spring fully formed from the heads of critics, both male and female, and attach themselves to any unwary character or author that wanders by. Women are still expected to be better than men, morally that is, even by women, even by some branches of the women's movement. And if you are not an angel, if you happen to have human failings, as most of us do, especially if you display any kind of strength or power, creative or otherwise, then you are not merely human. You're worse than human. You are a witch, a Medusa, a destructive, powerful, scary monster. An angel with pimples and flaws is not seen as a human being, but as a devil. A character who behaves with the inconsistency that most of us display most of the time is not a believable creation, but a slur on the nature of woman or a sermon. Not on human frailty, but on the special frailer than frail shortcomings of all womankind. There is still a lot of social pressure on a woman to be perfect, and also a lot of resentment of her should, be, should she approach this goal in any but the most rigid prescribed fashion. I could easily illustrate by reading from my own clipping file. I could tell you about Margaret the Magician, Margaret the Medusa, Margaret the Man-Eater, clawing her way to success over the corpses of many hapless men, Margaret the power-hungry Hitler, with her megalomaniac plan to take over the entire field of Canadian literature. This woman must be stopped. All these mythological creatures are inventions of critics, not all of them male. No one has yet called me an angel. But Margaret the Martyr will, sh will surely not take long to appear, especially if I die young in a car accident. In Canadian Monsters, some aspects of the supernatural in Canadian fiction, Atwood reminds us of what she made clear in Survival. She says that she started reading Canadian literature in self-defense because um, people, there was many people who said there wasn't any and that if she was serious about writing, then she should go to New York. And when it comes to magic and monsters, Atwood says that they seem excluded from Canadian literature. The North and the wilderness have been used as a symbol for the mysterious and magical in Canadian literature. But Atwood does point out that there is a large number of Canadian monsters that have their origin in Indigenous and Eskimo myths. Some of you may have heard of Wendingo and stories of the Wendingo. Atwood continues to give examples of Canadian literature in which the Wendingo and coyote non-humans appear, where semi-humans appear, and where magicians appear. On page 251, Atwood says that there are many more phenomena of a similar kind. Ghosts, witches, talismans, time travelers, premonitory dreams, poltergeists, and affairs with bears. Um, this latter seems to be a peculiarly Canadian interest as she's collected three, and I do know of a couple, actually I have some on my list, 
Um, but she says that she's surely dredged up enough specimens to indicate that there is indeed a mass of dark intimations in the Canadian literary soul. In part three, which is from 1977 to 1982, Atwood admits it's hard to characterize this period because at the time she was still in it, so she couldn't reflect back on it. So I wonder, you know, what she would say if we asked her now. Um, this part shows the diversity her reviews started taking. She was reviewing more for men and women writers and not all Canadians. This part begins with reviews for Anne Sexton, Timothy Finley, and many others. Atwood herself is also doing readings farther abroad in Australia and gives us a glimpse into that experience with Diary Down Under. From this I will share with you some of the questions Atwood was asked by Australians um, from page 304. I thought they were kind of funny. So Atwood says that these are several astonishing questions posed by the Australians. I'll share a couple with you. Don't I think it's fortunate Canada is right beside the United States and can benefit from the continual tension of having to define itself? Isn't it wonderful to have winter? The Australians are fascinated by the idea of snow. What is it like, they ask. Styrofoam, I tell them, only cold. In Australia, they say the weather is either so nice that you don't want to write or so hot that you can't. They have a charming picture of Canadian writers holed up during blizzards with little oil lamps writing masterpieces. How exciting to have the French. It must give such variety and richness to the culture. I can see their point. Australia does tend to be rather uniform. In Atwood's review of E.L. Dr. Rowe's Loon Lake, she says the following on page 325. What happens to a writer such as E.L. Dr. Rowe when a novel such as Ragtime sells 220,000 copies in hardback, gets translated into 20 languages, and wins the National Book Critics Circle Award for Fiction? A writer of a certain kind would merely try to duplicate these lush results as quickly as possible. A writer who is more serious must risk or perish. Everything about Dr. Rowe's career to date indicates that he considers the novel a vehicle for social and moral commentary, as well as an art form which should stretch the author's resources to their limits. But success on the ragtime scale in America almost automatically makes it more difficult for a writer to take himself seriously, partly because other, less successful writers begin to discount him. Post-romantic inverse snobbery attached to sales figures is still with us. Does 220,000 hardback copies really mean you're a schlock artist? Then there are all those critics gunning from the shrubberies. You've walked Niagara Falls on a tightrope once, but can you do it again? I would like to ask Atwood this question and how she has handled this because this review was written in 1980 and five years later Atwood would write her most well-known novel, The Handmaid's Tale. And she has certainly had success, as she calls it, with several of her writing since then. Um, so I think it would be very interesting what she would say and how she has handled that herself. One of my favorite essays in this entire book is called Witches, and I'm going to read a bit of it to you because I have such a clear image of Atwood as she describes this, and I love the anecdote that she shares and her humor um, where I will end. So this was written in 1980, and I'm going to begin reading from page 329. When I was walking through the rain in Cambridge today, lugging a heavy bag of books, having been sent to the wrong place, it was hard for me to believe that almost 20 years had passed since I first walked through Cambridge in the rain, lugging a heavy bag of books, with a deep suspicion that I had been sent to the wrong place. I had ostensibly come to Radcliffe to study Victorian literature, and that part of it was all right, since one of my fellow Canadians was teaching it here. But underneath my Victorian exterior, I fancied myself a poet. A fancy that, as anyone who has ever been a graduate studentess in English will know, it was death to admit. And all the modern poetry, as well as the devices for listening thereto, were locked in Lamont Library, which was restricted to students and banned to studentesses. Getting out a book of modern poetry required somewhat the same procedures as those needed to extract a book of pornography from the X section of the Widener Library. And being of a retiring nature, I didn't want anyone to see me doing the former under the mistaken impression that I was doing the latter. 
To this fact, I owe my ignorance of modern American poetry, as well as my Canadian nationalism. For the Canadian poetry was not kept with the real poetry, but was down with Canadiana in the bowels of the Widener, underneath ethnology and folklore, and freely accessible to students and studentesses alike. Walking around Cambridge today, trying to find out what I was supposed to be doing, a continuation of a lifelong endeavor, I was reminded of many happy afternoons spent in the bathtub on the third floor of Six Appian Way, which is, alas, no more. Reading Charles Dickens, scribbling dismal poems, and listening to the rain and the pitter-patter of sexual perverts as they scampered up and down the fire escape. I was also reminded of those many nights when I sat up until dawn, popping no-nods and trying to get my term papers finished on time. For I have to confess that I actually wrote this speech this afternoon in the greenhouse restaurant over a frogurt and a cup of Sanka. It is to my habits of procrastination and things academic that I owe my success as a writer. For if I had done scholarship true justice, how would I ever have had time to write? I did, however, learn an important distinction in graduate school. A speculation about who had syphilis when is gossip if it's about your friends. A plot element if it's about a character in a novel and scholarship if it's about John Keats. It was at Radcliffe too that I first heard about role models. The position of Dean, or was it Don, was open, and there was such discussion about, sorry, there was much discussion about who should fill it. We need a good role model, someone said. What's that, I asked, being from Canada. It was explained to me that for role modelhood, even at a university, scholarship was not the only requirement. One also had to be punctual, clean behind the ears, a good mother, well-dressed and socially presentable. I'm afraid I'm a bad role model, but then I long ago decided that I could be either a good role model or a writer, and for better or worse, I chose writing. Which brings me to the title of my address, a title I plucked from the air when presented with the need for one, without having the least idea of what I was going to say. I did feel, however, that it was appropriate to talk of witches here in New England for obvious reasons, but also because this is the land of my ancestors, and one of my ancestors was a witch. Her name was Mary Webster. She lived in Connecticut, and she was hanged for causing an old man to become extremely valetudinarius. Valetudinarius. Luckily, they had not yet invented the drop. In those days, they just sort of strung you up. When they cut Mary Webster down the next day, she was, to everyone's surprise, not dead. Because of the law of double jeopardy, under which you could not be executed twice for the same offense, Mary Webster went free. I expect that if everyone thought she had occult powers before the hanging, they were even more convinced of it now. She is my favorite ancestor, more dear to my heart even than the privateers and the massacred French Protestants, and if there's one thing I hope I've inherited from her, it's her neck. One needs a neck like that if one is determined to be a writer, especially a woman writer, and especially if you are good at it. In an end to an audience, I would tell stories which I love. Um, when asked the difference between a storyteller or a novelist, Atwood says there isn't one. I love that she shares this oral tradition. She talks about her family and how they share their own stories and how her parents weren't writers, but they were storytellers. Also, Atwood discusses the history of publishing in Canada from small literary presses to the fact that some, but not all Canadians, could actually make a living practicing their art. And thus a conversation on um, art and other professions ensued. And that writing is a craft, a profession, and an art. And Atwood also brings her concept of writer and audience that she talked about in Survival into this presentation. Um, the idea that without the audience, the writer is dead. Um, so she talks a bit about that. In Canadian American Relations, Surviving the 80s, Atwood states on page 372 that Canadian American Relations sounds like a dull subject, and it is, um, unless you've ever tried explaining them to an American. And throughout this presentation, Atwood intertwines her her own life with ways that Canadians and Americans differ and what that relationship has looked like. The other thing that comes up on this presentation is the supposed absence of Canadian literature and Canadian identity, which we have talked about before. On page 392, Atwood sums this presentation up beautifully. 
Americans and Canadians are not the same. They are the products of two very different histories, two very different situations. Put simply, south of you, you have Mexico, and south of us, we have you. The final essay that I'm going to talk about from Second Words is the address Atwood did in 1981 for Amnesty International. Um, I've considered actually reading this in its entirety to you, but I think I will just read a few parts. I think it's so well done, and it's probably one of the most important parts, uh, if not the most important part of the book, in my opinion. Um, the reason I say that is because it brings together everything Atwood has been talking about regarding what, you know, why write, uh, what makes a good writer, and what does this mean for writers around the world. Um, and what does it mean when the act of writing truth is taken from a writer? The address begins on page 393, and as I was reading this address, I was thinking how um, Atwood has such a pulse for Canada and its history, its literature, and that she writes of the importance of writing and using our privileged voice. Um, what I love most, and um, although it's not part of this book, is that this is not just Atwood spewing words. This is a belief that she has put and continues to put into action. Um, so yes, obviously through her writing, but she was also the first president of Penn International from 1984 to 1986. And Penn International is about freedom of expression. Penn defends persecuted writers and their belief is that literature helps bridge differences and fosters understanding between people. I will leave a link to both Amnesty International and Penn International in the description box below. The subject we have come together to address is one which increases in importance as the giants of this world move closer and closer to violent and fatal confrontation. Broadly put, it is what is the writer's responsibility, if any, to the society in which he or she lives. The question is not a new one. It's been with us at least since the time of Plato. But more and more, the answers of the world's governments have taken the form of amputation of the tongue, of the soul, of the head. We in Canada are ill-equipped to come to grips even with the problem, let alone the solution. We live in a society in which the main consensus seems to be that the artist's duty is to entertain and divert, nothing more. Occasionally, our critics are, get a little heavy and start talking about the human condition. But on the whole, the audience prefers art not to be a mirror held up to life, but a Disneyland of the soul, containing romance land, spy land, porno land, and all the other escape lands, which are so much more agreeable than the complex truth. When we take an author seriously, we prefer to believe that her vision derives from her individual and subjective and neurotic tortured soul. We like artists who have tortured souls, not from the world she is looking at, Sometimes our artists believe this version too, and the ego takes over. I, me, and mine are our favorite pronouns. We, us, and ours are low on the list. The artist is not seen as a lens for focusing the world, but as a solipis solipsism. We are good at measuring an author's production in terms of his craft. We are not good at analyzing it in terms of his politics, and by and large, we do not do so. In some countries, an author is censored not only for what he says, but for how he says it. And an unconventional style is therefore a declaration of artistic freedom. Here we are eclectic. We don't mind experimental styles. In fact, we devote learned journals to their analysis. But our critics sneer somewhat at anything they consider heavy social commentary, or a worse word, message. Stylistic heavy guns are dandy as long as they are pointed anywhere in particular. We like the human condition as long as it is seen as personal and individual. Placing politics and poetics in two watertight compartments is a luxury, just as specialization of any kind is a luxury. And it is possible only in a society where luxuries abound. Most countries in the world cannot afford such luxuries, and this North America way of thinking is alien to them. It was even alien in North America not long ago. We've already forgotten that in the 1950s, many artists, both in the United States and here, were persecuted solely on the grounds of their presumed politics. Which leads us to another mistaken Canadian belief. The belief that it can't happen here. It has happened here, many times. 
Although our country is one of the most peaceful and prosperous on earth, although we do not shoot artists here, although we do not execute political opponents, and although this is one of the few remaining countries in which we can have a gathering like this without expecting to be arrested or blown up, we should not overlook the fact that Canada's record on civil right issues is less than pristine. Our treatment of our native peoples has been shameful. This is the country in which citizens of Japanese origin were interned during the Second World War and had their property stolen. When a government steals property, it is called confiscation. It is also the country in which thousands of citizens were arrested, jailed, and held without warrant or explanation during the time of the War Measures Act, a scant 11 years ago. There was no general outcry in either case. Worse things have not happened, not because we are genetically exempt, but because we lead pampered lives. Our methods of controlling artists are not violent, but they do exist. We control through the marketplace and through critical opinion. We are also controlled by the economics of culture, which in Canada still happen to be those of a colonial branch plant. In 1960, the number of Canadian books published here was minute, and the number sold pathetic. Things have changed very much in 20 years, but Canadian books still account for a mere 25% of the overall book trade and paperback books for under 5%. Talking about this situation is still considered nationalistic chauvinism. Nevertheless, looked at in the context of the wider picture, I suppose we are lucky to have any percent at all. They haven't yet sent in the Marines, and if they do it won't be over books, but over oil. We in this country should use our privileged position not as a shelter from the world's realities, but as a platform from which to speak. Many are denied their voices. We are not. A voice is a gift. It should be cherished and used to utter fully human speech if possible. Powerlessness and silence go together. One of the first efforts made in any totalitarian takeover is to suppress the writers, the singers, the journalists, those who are the collective voice. Get rid of the union leaders and pervert the legal system and what you are left with is a reign of terror. The most lethal weapon in the world's arsenals is not the neutron bomb or chemical warfare, but the human mind that devises such things and puts them to use. But it is the human mind also that can summon up the power to resist, that can imagine a better world than the one before it, that can retain memory and courage in the face of unspeakable suffering. Oppression involves a failure of the imagination the failure to imagine the full humanity of other human beings. If the imagination were a negligible thing and the act of writing a mere frill, as many in this society would like to believe, regimes all over the world would not be at such pains to exterminate them. The writer, unless he is a mere word processor, retains three attributes that power mad regimes cannot tolerate. A human imagination in the many forms it may take, the power to communicate, and hope. So I know that that was a lot, and like survival, Atwood packs a lot in with second words. She's definitely a phenomenal reviewer because her own writing talent is incredible. She defends Canadian literature. She talks about the joys and challenges of writing, especially as writing as a woman, and she shares some of her humor and wit along the way. Once again, I have learned a lot about Atwood while uh, going through these various reviews and addresses. I do wonder what Atwood has to say about a few things now, um, but my greatest hope, and I think it's not only stayed consistent, but that it has been one of the you know main reasons for Atwood's success, um, is that she still has the same convictions about writing and about the purpose of a writer and in particular the love of Canadian literature. So please let me know what you thought of Second Words. Did you notice anything that I may not have mentioned? Um, is there anything that surprised you or that maybe affirmed something for you um, and your thoughts on Atwood? I would love to know what you think. As always, I will leave the reading schedule for this series uh, in the description box below. I will also add the links for Amnesty International and Penn International, um, and I look forward to chatting with you in the comments. Thanks again for watching. I hope you have a fantastic day, and don't forget to make every day an adventure.